Culture Shifters, thank you for joining us today at the Culture Shift podcast, where we work to shift the conversation to inspire a more balanced, peaceful, and compassionate world. Here at Culture Shift Podcast, we interview thinkers, activists, innovators, and artists who are shifting culture by defying the status quo. I'm Martha Williams, your host today, and I'm very excited to introduce you to our next guest, Jennifer Brown. Jennifer is a diversity and inclusion expert and the president and CEO of Jennifer Brown Consulting, a strategic leadership and diversity consulting firm that coaches businesses, advocating for social equality and helping businesses foster healthier, more productive workplaces. She's an award-winning entrepreneur, author, and fellow podcaster with the mission of unleashing the power of human potential. And with that, we welcome Jennifer Brown. Jennifer Brown, thank you so much for being here. With thank us today. you for having me. Yes, it's yeah. great to have you on the Culture Shift podcast. Thank you. So, Jennifer, you just wrote a new book. Yes. How to be an inclusive leader. First of all, this is this is uh, oh, there it is. Book, thank you. Thank which you. We're very excited about. <laughs> so, one of the things I was really struck by is that everybody has a diversity story, and at first read i'm like does really everybody have a diversity story so i just want you to clarify that a little bit and then here i want to hear a little bit about your diversity story. so i came to that because i discovered in myself and in others that so many of our diversity dimensions are hidden they're not visible or when we look at somebody we may not perceive them and they may choose not to show them or talk about them too so um, after a while of teaching this in so many classrooms with predominantly straight white men, for for example, executive teams, boards of directors, um, I would hear stories over and over again, really surprising me and kind of checking me on my assumptions about a group of people that I might be looking at and saying, they know nothing about this based on what I see. Mm. There's so much more to us. And that's my story too, because I identify as LGBTQ+. Plus, Mm -hmm. And I can pass, as we say in the community, every day of my life if I chose to. Mm -hmm. And it's been, um, it's been a really important check on me in terms of how inclusive I am in my language and right. how I try to not make assumptions about knowing people's backstories. I would also say that exclusion is a common and universal experience. Exclusion because you have a kid with special needs for example, right. exclusion because you feel you can't talk about uh, loved ones or, or a caregiving situation that you're in or a mental health issue. So many more dimensions actually about us are invisible. Mm -hmm. They're under, if we think of ourselves as icebergs, they're under our waterline, right? 10% right. is above, 90% is below. And so I've just learned so many times that I have to really truly walk the talk when it comes to inclusion. And what I am also struck by is, you know, it's diversity, and inclusion. Yes. And diversity, in a way, can be measured, mm -hmm. even if it's not visible. Sure. You can dig in and get some dimension to that and True. give numbers to it. Mm -hmm. um, but inclusion is less tangible. Yeah. So how do you get people to be more inclusive? We specialize in helping our clients improve their diversity, their inclusiveness, so their workplace culture to generate a sense of belonging. So where we're kind of coming to in this conversation is that belonging, when we feel that, we relax, we do our best work, we are our most creative, we are more likely to be retained, meaning we're more loyal to any kind of workplace. And this seems very intuitive, but, but belonging has so much to do with diversity and inclusion done well, because we are all we are all looking to have our voice and feel welcomed, valued, respected, and heard. Yes. And many of us, I hate to say it, and I know this is not a newsflash, don't feel that we are welcomed, valued, respected, and heard in our organizations. Yeah. Uh, because we are not reflected in people we see around us, we might be the only and lonely, as we say. Mm -hmm. And then inclusiveness is more, as you said, more difficult to measure because it's about behavior. Uh, and so in the future, and even in some of the forward thinking companies we work in, uh, managers are measured on inclusive behaviors and not just a self-report like, oh, I'm inclusive. Of course I'm inclusive. I have daughters, 
you know, women feel great working for me and for this company. Mm -hmm. Often we will be in the position of going with data that we've collected to people that say that and saying, guess what? You have a pay gap. Guess what? People don't feel that they have equal opportunity here. Mm -hmm. You know, so your intentions are fine and great. It's great to be well intended. But what really matters is impact. So we measure it from the outside in and we sort of show that. And that's a big aha moment for people. Yeah. And I've never met a company that doesn't have a problem. I'm kind of curious, why is it so hard to move towards inclusion? Mm. What is so difficult about it? Yeah, well, it's that we were just talking about the, the I'm well-intended, I'm a good person yeah. piece is really a barrier because that is not, that is a belief about ourselves and it has nothing to do with the impact that we're having. It's the difference between intent versus impact, which is one of our core teaching. And organizations take a lot of work to shift because they haven't been inclusive in the past. They have been honestly really homogeneous. People have been hiring their friends and their brother's friends and their, you know, somebody who went to the same school as they went to. Yeah. So it has sort of perpetuated this sameness, demographically speaking, in organizations. And it still happens so much today. It's the willingness to look at our own biases, which can, can, if we're not careful, make us feel a lot of shame and like we're bad people. And it's that yeah. shame is it's an a, indicator for where we need to be working because right. it's it's where we're hiding as a society mm. and as individuals. Mm. And what kind of environments do you create so people can come out of hiding and confront their own biases? Yeah. Well, I think the workplace is an interesting petri dish for this but in the workplace we are forced to work across difference more and more we're on global teams we're on virtual teams we're on um i mean we are literally having to get things done across difference every single day and that is if that's not true for people who are listening to this it will be <laughs> right and in a world of of um coronavirus and other things like the virtual working now is something that is at our doorstep if it wasn't before yeah so um, so it's a great place to pay attention to assumptions we make about each other, right. to check that bias, to think about our language, to think about how we're being inclusive virtually, which is actually a sort of additional difficulty level, yeah, I think, in terms of skill, yeah. because we're not um, given a lot of visual cues uh, or auditory cues, or, you know, we we're, we're have like an hour with somebody a day. We don't run into them or we don't, right? We don't have the opportunity to invite somebody to something on a weekend. You know, there's things we have to do to check in with each other to enable the diversity stories to be shared so that we can learn about each other and we have to give feedback also. Hey, that was an ouch for me. Like when you, yeah. mis, you know, misgendered me and we've had that discussion, you know, I, I just would like to give feedback how that felt. You know, things like this, we've got to be really good with language. If someone doesn't want to be called out on their bias, <laughs> how are they going to, or me, yeah, going to move through this world of inclusion? Mm -hmm. I just don't see how people are going to really step up to that thing. Because it's not a pleasant place. It's not a pleasant place. It's hard enough in intimate relationships to be honest about how you feel. Very true. Let alone inside of an organization where you're judged yeah. on your performance and your ability <laughs> to to produce. So how, how are we going to do that? It seems right. like a really tall order. Both sides have to be very gracious with mm. each other. It's about grace. What does that look like? Uh, what it looks like is, first of all, I prefer calling in versus calling out. So calling out on bias, let's like, let's not do that. <laughs> let's just not do it. It doesn't help, right? It's that energy. The call out energy is a, I'm the shame. It's mm. the, it's not a, hey, this is an opportunity for us to learn about each other. I want to share something with you about it, how it impacts me. It maybe even brings people deeper into the closet right of exactly their bias and their anger yes. and their, yes. their fear so it's all about language it's how you approach it it's how you approach it when you approach it who's around when you talk about it so the call out culture is i'm going to sort of hit you with how you made me feel and i'm going to do that maybe in public yeah and i may do it in social media god forbid not helpful when you have so many people who have no lived experience of what it feels like to walk in somebody's shoes, 
and you're, you think your role is to call out all the time, it's a recipe for shutting everything down. It mm-hmm. just is. So if somebody says to me, you know, tell me what your husband does, I have like 10 choices about how I should respond to that. What's the call out energy in that? What could I do to massively humiliate this person yeah. and literally scare them away from the conversation for a year? My ask would be, can we afford to lose anyone that could be learning? Yeah. I mean, to me, I don't think so. I'm all about holistic change Mm -hmm. that includes everyone moving forward. I wrote this book. It was frustrating to write this book. I wrote it because I thought it was needed, because I needed to go back and meet people where they're at. I need this whole cohort of people to come forward on this that are literally stuck in shame, literally like taking their marbles and going home, literally feeling like nobody's talking to me about how I can, I can influence this. And it's just such a lost opportunity. The book is very much a call to action to like get involved, but, but, but PS, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to be uncomfortable. You should feel shame for a minute. But what's most important is not to get, you know, get so into the shame that you literally get paralyzed and then you, you leave. You sort of opt out. You say, there's nothing I can do to change this. Like, to me, that is the unacceptable answer. So I, you start your book out with a story about being in front of a group of white men mm-hmm. giving a presentation about diversity and inclusion. Yes. Yeah. And you talk about your fear and what you're covering and how you're experiencing the topic. So just speak to that a little bit more. There's so many things in that story because I'm, I'm at the same time in that room because I have certain levels of privilege um, to even get in that room mm-hmm. because of the way I look, the way, you know, what my ethnicity is, for example, yeah. perhaps my education, a lot of things. Um, and at the same time, I feel in rooms like that, sort of like my pulse is quickening. You know, I'm very much on high alert and I'm not feeling safe, mm. right? And so that's due to being a woman in a male-dominated environment, right? That that experience of being anything in an, in an environment where you're the only and you're there to, you're there to talk about something that's pretty sensitive. Mm-hmm. And then also being LGBTQ and, and feeling, you know, if I bring this up, is it going to make, to compromise my message? Is it going to damage my credibility? Is it going to distract people from what I really need them to be paying attention to? Yeah. And so, and those are just two diversity dimensions, but what I'm so empathetic about based on what I've learned is this is the experience of so many people that don't have the privileges that I have, although everybody has a level of privilege, right? Mm -hmm. I would argue anyone that is employed right now in a job with benefits, privilege, or working for a company that is trying to do diversity and inclusion versus all the people that aren't working for, I mean, there's so many privileges. Um, Mm -hmm. Being able to physically walk into a room from an abled perspective, perhaps being cisgender, um, you know, our gender identity gives us certain sort of a level of like ease perhaps, like around like, I don't have to think about like, how do I transition in this workplace? Then they don't have any benefits that protect me. I mean, it just goes on and on. Yeah. So we all have a level of privilege that gets us in some room, right? Yeah. So for me, I'm just acutely aware of the ones that enable me to get into a room. And that's where I think diversity storytelling is so important. And for me to be very, um, as overt as I can about what this feels like for me mm-hmm. to be in this room. And then as a microcosm of what people are feeling in that organization. So I try to generate empathy and understanding and create that aha moment for rooms that look like that in whatever way I can. If I can get in there, I'm going to try to do that. But I have to be tremendously creative and also careful that I'm not too strident or I'm not too opinionated. I have to use my power in these really interesting ways uh, to not repel people from the conversation because they are repelled from this conversation. Now, I might argue, if you're a straight white guy and you're in executive leadership, how big is the risk? Really? I don't know. I think the person that's taking the risk in that room is me Mm -hmm. that day in terms of bringing my full self. Yeah. And then I will speak for alongside all of my friends and people that I love who really, really, really have so many diversity dimensions that they can't downplay 
or high, they walk in the room. And if you are a queer woman of color, you got a lot of decisions to make because there's all kinds of biases and stereotypes that may or may not be happening that you may or may not know about that may be impacting how you're heard. And if there is one thing you can hide that day, you may hide it because it's just so much. It's just so much. How do you navigate that? And then for women of color and particular people of color, there are, there are things we all need to be aware of in terms of how strong you are, in terms of a communicator, in terms of your passion. Your passion can be like immediately misinterpreted mm -hmm. as anger, immediately. Or your gestures can be interpreted as too strong and sort of in your face. So these are the kinds of things I wish people on the other end would be aware of all these dynamics that are swirling around. And can you imagine, what is it like then to be present, be creative, be productive, be focused, all the things that we need to be in business when all of this noise is going on in terms of whether I'm gonna be believed in this room, whether I'm going to be given a fair shot. Like it's completely, I mean, when you talk about the importance of productivity, every business leader should be obsessed with this. Like who's not bringing their full self to work? Why? What is getting in their way? How am I contributing to that? One of the things <clears> we <throat> talk about at the Culture Shift Agency is this idea of a process economy versus a production economy. Mm. So we have- mm, I like that. Historically, we live in a production economy. Yeah, yeah. It's based on the assembly line. It's based on efficiency. We're looking at more of a process economy yeah. where we have to have a sense of the person inside the cog in the wheel is not just a cog. The cog in the wheel is a person. Yeah. To me, I think you're speaking to where we're going in our economy, which is we are going to have robots running that assembly line soon. Mm -hmm. So we might want to learn how to deal with humans. <laughs> so yeah. what's the experience of yeah. uh, these men in that, in that room? Honestly, I mean, the stories they share with me after they don't speak up in the meeting. For men, there's a ton of pressure to conform. I mean, I, this shouldn't be a newsflash, but like there's tons of diversity issues that are going on amongst men that they don't know how to talk about. Um, Mark Green calls it, and uh, Tony Porter also gave a great TED talk on the man box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once I learned about that, that helped me also be inclusive of all dimensions of diversity, particularly ones that are invisible for a group of people that might look like straight, cisgender white guys. Yeah. Um, I've got to check myself. You know, um, but the man box is is prevents any kind of man who doesn't conform to a certain behavioral expectation. And this is very predominant in executive suites, right? There is this lack of vulnerability. There is this um, not understanding or caring about diversity or hiding diversity stories that are happening to people, but they don't talk about because that man box is such a straight jacket. So you, in your keynotes, say, hey, diversity <clears throat> looks like a lot of things. There's a lot of dimensions. And so you start to speak to the dimensionality of the straight white man, because that's what people see. They see the straight white man, you've mm -hmm. got it all. <laughs> right? Right. But there's all <laughs> what's happening under the water lines, what that's you right. call it. That's so right. I would argue a workplace that was built by and for one group mm -hmm. Uh, certainly isn't good for the rest of us. We often yeah. say yeah, as women and others, you know, the workplace wasn't built by and for me. So this is fundamentally what we're struggling with from yeah. benefits to pay gap to all of it. But I would argue the, that it's not good for the men either <laughs> in terms of their own ability to flourish. I mean, whether they realize that or not, um, mm -hmm. you know, we struggle to communicate the business case for this. We struggle to convince. I mean, we, I spend so much time sort of arguing 15 different ways from empathy to the data to the you don't want to be called out in social media to there's a brand risk here reputational right like i have to like twist myself up into a pretzel to try yes. to get people to care i also say you know by the way your kid could come home tomorrow and come out to you as transgender are you going to be ready yeah one in five people under the age of 35 identifies as not straight and not cis one in five so any parent who's sort of in la-la land and saying, oh, the diversity team will take care of that. That's not my job. Or I send my people to unconscious bias training once a year and I can check that box. It is not, it's not your, you, you may not realize it. <laughs> this has to be a competency for you. It, yeah. it is in the top five leadership competencies of the future. Inclusive leadership is you've got to know, understand at least beyond a journey. 
And if you don't have all the answers, because you're not going to, because by the way, I don't even have all the answers. Like, and I study this all the, all day long and I still make mistakes. I still have to apologize. I still have to make sure my language is up to date. Um, get on the journey and talk about the fact that you're on the journey. Be it's, transparent. It seems to me that at the, ve the very first step in any of this is vulnerability. Uh. And I think that that is an, the antithesis of the corporate exactly. environment. That's so, what we have to address. Because the women have been conforming to a workplace, an executive suite not built by and for them. Yeah. And we have the battle scars to prove that. Yeah. You know, I mean, when I, young women say, why are all the senior women like not making time for me? Or why are they so hard on me? <laughs> I love that that conversation is so interesting because yeah. women of a certain generation just crawled through glass if they're even still in the workplace, yeah. because there was not a place at the table and there were so many sacrifices and so much demands for yeah. assimilation that were placed and on women of a certain generation that blazed the trail, you know? So it's just, I have just a lot of compassion for that. And I stand on those shoulders. I mean, the fact that I can bring my full self and be an entrepreneur. I mean, I'm a corporate refugee. I could not be heard. And actually it wasn't because of not being out. Actually it was, I had, I think I had too much creativity for the corporate world. Yeah. I mean, I'm an artist yeah. and I'm all about expressing ourselves and bringing our full selves. And I looked at the cog in the wheel model. Uh -huh. I looked at the production economy and, and I said, like, there is no way I can flourish in this. Yeah. Like I will die. In the section of your book where you talk about diversity dimension, you talk about this thing called the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear a little bit about that. And I also want to hear about covering mm. because covering is one of the ways that you deal with the iceberg, what's That's underneath right. the waterline. That's right. So covering is downplaying a known stigmatized identity. So when we were even talking about the workplace and how many parts of us we don't bring, when we yeah. say bring your full self to work, and that would enable us, I think, to feel more seen and heard and therefore more relaxed and feel a sense of belonging, right? I think we put so much effort to downplaying these things that it, it's a distraction, um, but it also impacts our morale, I believe, because mm. because it leads to, I think, a shame about covering identities that are very important to us, but that we don't feel will be accepted. Mm -hmm. right? right. So yeah. I, maybe I'm struggling with mental illness in myself or in a loved one. Yeah. Maybe my kid just came out to me and I don't feel that any other parents in this organization are having my experience, which is not true. Yes. Right. You're never alone, but we feel alone. And so the organization needs to get smart about, and I help them do this, get smart about naming these things because naming things mm -hmm. is the first step to normalizing them. Interesting. And when a senior person particularly names things and uh, therefore maybe shares a diversity story that's yeah. personal or takes a risk and is a little bit vulnerable or a lot vulnerable, that is how normalization occurs because that is leadership behavior and storytelling is so critical. It can impact thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Yeah. When a CEO tells a diversity story, it's enormous. I mean, that one thing could take the rest of us 10 years to accomplish <laughs> because we have so much less power and we're dealing with so much more stereotypes in terms of bringing our full selves to work. So we may be telling our story all the time and it's not being heard. And we may not have the organizational power or influence to truly change things, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just this tremendous imbalance of power. And I, I think that's another reason I really need leadership to do something even small because it has this sort of outsized ripple effect. So the iceberg is, we all know 10% is above the waterline. That's what's acceptable, right? And people follow other people. We mimic other people. We, we look ahead and up to say, are there any out executives? And if we don't see any out executives or we know that somebody is out, but they're covering in the workplace, I'm not talking about it. Mm -hmm. All of us on the, in the sort of general population of the, of the company read that and say, well, clearly it's not safe. Yeah. Right. So that causes covering behavior on our part. Right. Right. And so we mimic, men mimic other men, men watch other men for behavior cues. Yeah. And they particularly watch senior men, which dominate the workplace today. So if we've got a, a whole cohort of people that are not, talking about this in a meaningful way and personalizing it, well, how are we going to interpret that? So uh, the iceberg has, um, it's really fascinating because there's so many dimensions under that waterline. Um, I've been adding to the dimensions because every time I keynote, people give me new ones. <laughs> so uh, recently I've added sober and recovery. 
right? So much of the workplace is predicated on alcohol. Uh, so I think that interestingly, each one of these dimensions, I think if we addressed them, uh, they would actually benefit many more people than just that one dimension, right? If we sort of, if we focus on who's one population that might be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. it actually encourages others to speak up and say, well, actually, I've never really been comfortable with that, right? So you're giving language to the things that make people feel uncomfortable. Right. And, and nobody has questioned before. It's literally just the orthodoxy of how business is done. And it's sort of bringing to light that business is done by keeping a really narrow view on what is acceptable or what's comfortable for some that they don't question. Um, I had a Jewish executive, a man on a Christian management team say, I'll share Jennifer. Like when I was new here, we scheduled a meeting over my high holidays and I didn't I went home to my wife and I said, should I say anything? And we decided that I wouldn't say anything. And so I flew across the world over my holiday and I didn't say anything. Like I don't make it a big deal because like that's just but the bias to me, the responsibility for that is for, is amongst his Christian led management team to say, are we being inclusive of all faiths? Like, yeah. uh, but just the lack of awareness is so it causes the covering behaviors because those of us who would bring our difference to the table feel that we're taking such a risk to do so. Right. So what true. kind of qualities do we need to be bringing to the table so that we can move forward and be creative in the way that we mm. create inclusivity? Yeah, I mean, it's a two-way street, like we were talking about earlier. I think those of us who are sort of sprinted ahead and far along in this conversation need to rewind mm. and meet learners where they're at and not be judgmental about people who don't have the answers yet. Right. And you talked a little bit about this in our phone call where some in the diversity community, there's a lot of contention. Yeah. And division, ironically. Mm. Can you speak to that? There's a not bit? a lot of patience. Mm. And when you have the bully pulpit of Twitter, uh -huh. when there are Slack channels at the company and people can just pile on. But the hard part is that there's really good data and there's really important information being shared in those Slack channels too. Okay. Right. So there's, it's a double edged. Yeah. So if I so have what? a client who says like, well, that's just complaining and you know, it's, it's caught fire and it's spreading and like, I got to bring it under control. And I'm, there's not a lot of listening that I hear in that. And I think the, it's sort of these choices of shut it down, mm -hmm. right. Or it's inappropriate or people are out of hand, or if we build this as a forum, is it gonna get out of control? And then do we have to build forums for everyone? I mean, literally, these are the sorts of questions we get. I mean, I had a CEO, we recommended employee resource groups, so affinity groups, that they create them so that they get better mm -hmm. at this. And the CEO thought about it, and we tried to convince him that they're important. And he just came back at the end and said, I just think, I believe that they're forums for complaints. And I don't believe that they will be productive for us. For me, the base issue here is that as a society and as a people, we have no understanding of how to deal with our anger mm. and our sadness <laughs> in a productive way. True. And because of that, when the lid gets, gets, it uh, gets messy, it, it, just nobody knows how to deal with it. So to me, there uh, needs to be a, a revolution in vulnerability and a revolution in how we handle anger and yeah. how we handle our sadness. And how we hold space for each other. Absolutely. Because, so where does my anger belong? I have anger. But the question to me is, um, it's productive to feel, for sure. We, we've got like, we to feel it. We the question is where and when. And I know sometimes you can't control when it comes out. Yeah. And that's understandable. And those of us on the receiving end of that have to just hold it. So if we could counterbalance that with allyship, mm. which is what I talk about so much. And also another word for that is advocacy. Another word is accomplicing. Uh -huh. The accomplicing behavior mindset space holding is, is thank you so much for entrusting me with what it feels like to be you. And let me carry that forward. And I will take my cue from people who are not being heard and I will bring that with me and I will 
bring that into places that I can. I will speak up. Mm -hmm. I will offer support. I will give support without even being asked to give it. I mean, my favorite allies as an LGBTQ person, mm -hmm. straight allies are the ones that when I'm on, not in the room, they are confronting a joke and a comment. Right. right? They're the one. They don't need to be asked by me for help. They are literally like monitoring for inclusion and saying, hey, that's not right. I need to I need to have a conversation with that leader who looks like me or maybe shares yeah. my identity to say, like, by the way, like these are the words we use now. And again, it's not even it's not the calling out in public either among even in that group. I would argue a private conversation is always better. Give a leader a chance to adjust yeah. when uh, somebody says like a big thing in my community is sexual preference versus sexual orientation. Yeah. It's not a preference. It is something that is innate. We all have a sexual orientation. It's on a continuum, just like our gender identity is also on a continuum. Yeah. I mean, there is like trigger warnings and all kinds of things that are happening around um, Generation Z. What the new generations are bringing into the workplace is this sort of like all parts of me are great. I mean, this is not going to be the generation that feels the shame that like you and I might have felt right. in trying to bring our full selves to work and having no role models and feeling that we needed to conform. Like that's changed and changing. Yeah. And so we're not gonna have a generation that is willing to compromise. And I think that the leaders that don't look like this generation and don't share those values of inclusion as table stakes are really gonna be behind the eight ball in terms of yeah. like, I don't know what this means. And yet we're getting all this like employee activism like, how am I, how am I being an inclusive leader when I don't have the lived experience that the younger generation in my own workplace right. has? Like, we can only get work done by and for and with each other. Like, that's, that's our currency. It's the process economy. Yeah. It's how we work together. It's how we feel working together. It's not just what we produce. Right. And it hasn't been very long that what one feels even matters. I know it's so early days for that whole conversation. And I, I, I sit here and hold both sides and I'm like, this is a disaster because we're so in our infancy in terms of a certain generation, even understanding what this means. And then we've got this whole new generation who expects to like talk about their pronouns at work. This group doesn't even know what pronouns means. Yeah. They got to come together and understand how to teach each other and learn from each other and and influence each other and be heard by each other. So um, our producer, one of our producers, Aaron, yes. just took the I know. Just to real time feedback. feedback uh, my assessment. assessment. Yes. Yes. And what was his observation was like, hmm, I don't know how well I fit into this test because I'm not so in a regular corporate environment. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if people who don't fit into the box step out of the corporate environment. And you mm -hmm. spoke to that a little bit for mm -hmm. yourself, why mm -hmm. you started your company. Right. Even. Just curious about the assessment. Yes. Can you tell us and a little bit about it that? Speaks to, and who it speaks to. Yeah. yeah. And then my thoughts perhaps on um, what the message is for entrepreneurs and self-employed. I mean, if we're really going towards a gig economy, which I think is true, perhaps hastened by global pandemics and lots of other things, and also hastened by the fact that we don't feel our organizations just don't see us and hear us. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that level of frustration and feeling literally blocked. What do we do? We make lemonade out of lemons. We either hang in there or we leave and we start our own thing. <laughs> and this yeah. is why the fastest number of um, entrepreneurs, fastest growing populations is women and people of color. So those are the fastest growing number of businesses being created, right? And the amount of wealth that's being generated. Like we're in the midst of a huge sea change where I think people can say, you know, I don't want to be that cog. And if we're moving to a process-based organization, the process feels yucky. So what I would say is the assessment, um, it's the inclusive leader assessment. You can find out more on jenniferbrownspeaks.com. You take it for free. It's 10 minutes. Um, what I would say is that think about all the aspects of your life. Uh, think about how you can use your voice as a freelancer, for example, with your clients. So we can always be influencing. So if I'm a freelancer and I'm, I'm a consultant, I mean, I'm serving companies, right? They hire me to do something. I can always be, I think, witnessing this conversation in every interaction. Mm. You know, I can point out who's missing from the table in a creative process. I can elevate and choose to, you know, um, underscore a point that somebody made. Meetings are a great place to kind of practice inclusive leadership. Yeah. But I think... Um, we could say, you know, hey, did we consider 
we're in this creative process. We're, we're building products, right? We're building a campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, do we, are, we in, are we sure we're including all voices in this? Yeah. Who are we selling to? What's our market? What's the diversity of that market? Mm -hmm. Whatever you're bringing to market, it's going to suffer if a homogeneous group is building it, period. Like, that's a fact. You, there's a ton of research on it. So if you're educated around that, even though that's perhaps not your job, per se, to be that in the room, we can make comments and give feedback on this all the time, regardless of what our role is. I would also argue, are you in a church group? Are you on a board for your school? Are you in a parenting network? Are you part of the PTA? Mm -hmm. How are you, you, I can guarantee if your school hasn't had a diversity issue, you know, it's happening. Mm -hmm. So what if there's one person who's different? Maybe it's a yeah. uh, one, one person, person of color, of color. Mm -hmm. you know, is there something that the group can do? Don't always make the person of color or the only woman in the room be the educator. Right. Super important. We call, in my world, we call this emotional labor. Oh, okay. So I'm always, all eyes will turn to me if I'm the only LGBTQ person in the room to sort of explain everything. You've got to understand that we are always explaining. We're always having to come out. We're always, mm. it feels very much like people are being lazy about their own learning. It's like, don't turn to the one person to say, well, what do you think about this? You know, as the only woman that my vision of what happens is, is we've got a lot of allyship and a lot of allies and people who've actually done the reading and educated themselves and said, you know, let me try to answer that based on what I understand. And, and this is a balance, too, because, you, by the way, you don't want to speak for. Yeah. But you don't want to rely, over rely. Yeah. So there is a balance here. Know enough to be dangerous. Know enough yeah. about, know three points about different identities than yours. Just, like, try to research. Mm -hmm. Know a couple stats about disabilities, like people with disabilities. And, for example, the fact that they are knocked out of the resume pool often because there's a gap in their resume. You know how we don't like yeah. gaps in resumes? That's like a big thing. It's a big derailer for people with disabilities. And it's completely a bias. Another bias would be um, criminal background. There is a massive talent pool that could be working right now. Mm -hmm. And we have a giant talent shortage. I mean, pay attention to who you're hiring. <laughs> I mean, if you're not careful, you're going to end up, if you're a straight white guy or a white cisgender woman, you're going to end up with an entire team that looks like you because your network is gonna literally come to you and they're all gonna look like you. And if you don't put some gates around that, you're gonna end up creating a founding team. And then what becomes more difficult is as you grow, that founding team multiplies. They multiply, they get their own networks in, which look like them. And new recruits are gonna look at your founding team and say, there's no place for me there. You have this incredibly successful company Jennifer Brown Consulting, you go into mm -hmm. companies and you help them. Mm -hmm. You've written this new book and now you're speaking all over the country. So what is next? Uh, there's so many books I want to write. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like, we were just talking about the whole question of being self-employed, um, small business owner inclusion, right? Mm -hmm. How do I do this when I'm the chief cook and bottle washer and everything in between when I'm trying to just, just stay alive? Right. Um, when you have to be fast. Yeah. And you're, totally. you don't have time. I don't have time. Oh, to yeah. Move. We're just, we're growing so fast. I just needed to hire my friend and my brother's friend. And <laughs> it's just, yeah. Um, I think I need to probably do another keynote and TED talk mm -hmm. on some of the emerging concepts that I'm playing with um, right. around allyship and accomplicing and privilege mm -hmm. um, and really be a, a lot more overt about that. I think, um, mm. because I'm, I, I'm frustrated with how slow I have to go on this stuff. Honestly, um, it's hard for me. Yeah. And I think that's why a lot of people don't have the patience for it. And they would rather, you know, have the three, three point conversation, but the yeah. 1.0 conversation has to happen. Like we are ready to have the conversation, but our clients aren't. But you need to just have that conversation with Bob by the water cooler first. <laughs> I know. Kind of warm up the engine Bob, a little hey bit. Bob, so hey, Bob. How do you feel? <laughs> Let's take a little walk. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so it's a little bit. It's, but, so what does overt mean to you? Well, um, taking more risks. Mm. I mean, I think that somebody like me that looks like me, that has my particular um, stance towards this problem is really important. We need a lot more, I think we need more folks in the center 
in the middle um, that are sort of, you know, uh, I always feel like I'm on a bridge, you know, and there's like two sides and nobody wants to cross. And I'm trying to ensure safe passage, mm -hmm. right? But I feel, some of us feel very much like we're being torn asunder. <laughs> and it's both sides. It is for sure both sides because there's, some people don't want to know anything about other people on the other side of the bridge. Like no, like they're dehumanized. Like right. I do not, we need to build a new world that doesn't include anyone that doesn't understand this. Like we are going full steam ahead, right? And I think it's super dangerous. <laughs> it's sort of like, I'm taking it down. Yeah, you know? and, and yeah. That's also not the spirit of um, vulnerability that's really necessary for real change to happen. It's just this, it's just uh, the, the other side of the coin. It is, it's the same behaviors mm -hmm. that got us here, but applied differently. Yeah. It's sort of, um, when we tear ourselves apart amongst sort of community of advo advocates, if I can just refer to it that way, we are just hurting ourselves, mm -hmm. we are. So we need more teaching, we need more patience and grace, we need more space holding. Um, we've got to find a way forward that includes everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's going to require, um, some really like tough sort of soul searching. I think for some of us who, who feel a ton of anger and frustration with the pace of change, mm -hmm. I, I struggle with the discomfort too. And this yeah. is why I think I can stand on the bridge because, um, I, I hesitate, I'm uncomfortable. So I know, cause I'm living this. Yeah. And if I'm living this and I'm, I'm somebody that sort of has the stamp of approval to be in those rooms, theoretically, because right. of the work I do, it, I know the discomfort is like 10 times. Right. And so I'm sitting here with that, thinking about how am I solving my own problem? And then how am I going back and getting everybody else who's like much less equipped to yeah. do what they need to do? Like this work is the hardest thing you will ever do and the most amazing thing you'll ever do because you're staring into people's hearts, like literally. And... And if you do what I do every day, you're looking at organizations as systems, you know, of any size. And you're saying like, how does where is the heart? Happen? Well, where is the heart? Where is, is a the great heart? question. Yes. And it's in individuals because I know there, otherwise I wouldn't have the hope I have to do this work. Well, thank you so much thank for you. coming and sharing exactly. all that insight with us. You're and so welcome. For your fierce heart. Thank and you. Like all the work that you do in this, your, your two books. Thank and, you for seeing me. Yeah. And all my intentions and hopefully impact. <laughs> yes, I think so. I think you're doing okay. And where can people find you? Oh, yes. Um, I'm big in social media. So look for me on Twitter at Jennifer Brown. Okay. Instagram is at, at Jennifer Brown Speaks. Okay. Uh, jenniferbrownspeaks.com is also my speaker website. So you can see footage of my keynotes there. You can take the assessment we've been talking about. Uh, you can download the first chapter of the new book for free. Mm -hmm. So please do that. Join our mailing list if this is a topic that you know you need to get on a journey about or further your journey. Uh, and then I'm, of course, on LinkedIn and Facebook, all the places. All the places. So um, I also have a podcast oh, yes, myself. You have a podcast. It's, it's called The Will to Change. And I would uh, recommend really, it's such an educational podcast. It's mm -hmm. honestly something that a lot of my clients listen to to sort of learn about the, some of the topics we talked about today right. and, and hear people's diversity stories that you don't expect. And so yeah. it really, I think, challenges you as a listener to say, wow, this person's that and that and that, and they've done this. And, you know, just seeing that example, yeah. you often say it just takes knowing and hearing about one person's right. story and it really just shifts everything. So that's my goal on the podcast. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And we will see you next time. I love the next yes. time. Thank Thanks, you. Martha. Thank you so much for joining us today for our interview with Jennifer Brown. The transcripts and links related to this podcast, as well as other episodes, are available at cultureshiftagency.com. See you next time on next month's episode.